Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to the Long Finance Conference here at the Willis Corporate Headquarters. My name is Duncan Holmes, um, and I have, I'm the Managing Director of our Financial Institutions and Professional Risk Practice here in London. We're delighted to host such a thought-proking visionary event promoting long-term sustainability in finance, the environment, and social responsibility. Here at Willis too, we try to take a long-term view, and in building this magnificent new headquarters, we were passionate to achieve the highest level of sustainability rating we could, and I'm pleased to announce that we, indeed, we did achieve an excellent rating. Willis has 20,000 employees worldwide, spread over 400 offices in about 119 countries, um, advising clients how to manage and transfer their risks to hopefully give them some long-term stability. So you're not here to listen to me, so I would like to now hand over to Professor Michael Manelli, Chairman of ZYEN, who will open today with a short introduction to long finance entitled Long Finance Made from Real Money. Michael. Thank you, Duncan. Appreciate it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Long Finance. As we say in commerce to business, time is short, our program is long, which is rather ironic as we're talking about long finance, our financial system over a period of, say, 75 to 100 years. The Long Finance Initiative began with a conundrum. When would we know our financial system is working? And I want to spend a moment just retracing our steps. When Ian Harris and I founded Zien back in 1994, we started writing about systemic weaknesses, accounting, sustainability, transparency, credit ratings, liquidity, regulation, you name it. And over the years, we filled columns for various journals, such as the Journal of Risk Finance and others. Over the past five years, uh, some of you will realize I filled 29 Gresham lectures with things I wanted to get off my chest. My wife may find that surprising, as she'd probably rather I got some things off my stomach, but, uh, but there you have it. Along the way, others joined in. In 2005, Jan-Peter Onstvedder helped us establish the London Accord for environmental, social, and governance research. When the credit crunch broke in 2007, we wrote about the religion of regulation and the wicked problems uh, involved in good financial markets. Our key question has always been, when would we know our financial system is working? And in presentations around Europe and the USA, we pose this question to audiences, to clients, to dinner companions. So when Bob Giffords approached us about writing a book analyzing the financial crisis, we had a lot of material to combine with his thought-provoking ideas. We termed the current financial crisis credit scrunch in the firm conviction that much more is at stake than just recovery from current economic confusion. Scrunch means to crush, to crumple, to squeeze. And our booklet analyzed the credit scrunch as a systemic failure with multiple causes and multiple effects. We believe that an important discontinuity requires a holistic rethink and response. The booklet is in your packs today and is distributed free online. And from all this, we decided to do something. A kitchen cabinet came together. Their names are on the back of the flyer. But seeking a name for the project itself, I pondered something I'd heard about long now. A crazy attempt to build a clock that bonged once every hundred years and with a cuckoo coming out once every thousand. Long now was looking at ten millennia and I wondered if finance could look forward just one lifetime. We contacted the Long Now folk and instantly found immense support and common ground. Anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss concluded that the learned man is not the man who provides the correct responses, rather he is the man who poses the right questions. And what strikes me most about Long Now is the impertinence of their questions. Now, financial systems haven't been working. I once wrote, something threatens the entire global financial system. That is, the entire global financial system. Historian Neil Ferguson concurs. He writes, by the end of 2007, 15 megabanks with combined shareholder equity of 857 billion had total assets of 13.6 trillion and off-balance sheet commitments of 5.8 trillion. 19.3 trillion in total, an aggregate leverage ratio of 23 to 1. 
They had also underwritten derivatives with a gross national value of 216 trillion, more than a third of the total. Global GDP is only 55 trillion. And this was controlled by an oligopoly of 15 investment banks, four auditing firms, and three credit rating agencies, which reduced diversity and encouraged herd behavior. But the tr 10 trillion of rescue money spent so far has been spent on one, increasing the money supply, two, reducing your motivation to save, and three, consolidating the banking sector further. Now, Mason Colley pointed out that the question you're not supposed to ask is the important one. And it surprised us that despite the biggest crash in our lifetimes, we heard few good questions. Murmurs in the hallway about when things might return to normal. Now, everyone has their favorite fixes, some of them contradictory, but the question we should be asking far more stridently is, when would we know our financial system is working? And over the past two years, we've realized we're hardly alone. At our last long finance event, nearly 40 people out of the 120 who came were still debating in Gresham's courtyard 90 minutes after the event had finished. But more permanent solutions need these impertinent questions, such as when can we fund a forest? Or when can a 20-year-old responsibly enter into a financial arrangement or structure for their retirement? An average 20-year-old today should under reasonable actuarial assumptions, live to 95. Most 20-year-olds with whom I chat assume they'll live to at least 120. So the question implies a financial structure that should last 75 to 100 years. And such questions raise a host of related issues. Such questions draw in actuaries, accountants, demographers, insurers, bankers, investment managers, politicians, savers, consumers, and 20-year-olds. And long finance is therefore meant to be a collaborative vehicle dedicated to renewing long-term commerce from an intellectual and systems perspective. We aim to improve society's understanding and use of finance over the long term. We'd like to combine some of the long now vision with intellectual rigor and some of the community aspects of the London Accord. We definitely intend to move commercial, regulatory, and government thinking from responsive to anticipatory and hopefully from local to global. Current government thinking is confused about reform. It's incremental at best and overly complex. This slide, shared by Anthony Kirby of Ernst & Young, is an overview of just EU initiatives and takes account neither of national nor international nor G20 reforms. Long Finance hopes to avoid the thickets of current micro-reforms, taking the debate towards innovative solutions. Now, our iconic focus of long finance, comparable, we think, to the clock of the long now, although hardly as big, is the paradoxical concept of enduring value. And thanks to Neil Stevenson's push for us to do something physical, what we call the eternal coin. The eternal coin is a thought experiment that speculates on whether a coin that never loses value could exist, and if such a coin could exist, how might it be constructed? Value is, of course, intrinsically tied to future exchange, calls on future wealth. And the logos are based around a Mobius strip, the coin you can't flip because it has one side. The coin's motto is real money made from eternal coins and eternal coins made from real money. Of course, a Mobius strip is also without end, an endless conveyor belt of values from the past to the future. The Eternal Coin project, we hope, will be explainable to the man on the street and link the research. We're designing an online game where people can create their own currencies and talk about what enduring value means in a sustainable financial system. Will it be combinations of currencies, bonds, shares, energy, forestry, land, water, or carbon, or Bernard Leterre's Terra? We're exploring mobile applications so people can trade Eternal Coins in a giant scenario planning exercise. And we're looking to create pedagogical materials leading perhaps to events rolling around the world. Back in 1990, David Hilbert assembled all the mathematicians to set out a successful roadmap for the 23 big math problems that dominated the 20th century. His metamathematics roadmap resulted in 17 of the problems being solved so far. Emulating David Hilbert's successful approach, we'd like to host a metacommerce discussion creating a roadmap for commerce and finance research. We have also mapped out eight themes for research based around a traveling series of events. 
as well as reports and software, each theme should produce an eternal coin. For example, the sustainability team might issue PEAK, a basket currency weighted by the remaining life of key resources. We're seeking formal research funding for the themes, and I give you a sample here, ranging from studying the finances of institutions of longevity, for example, the Vatican, or what can we learn from economics in harsh climates, the Bushmen, the Inuit. We want to challenge thinking. Had long finance existed in 1900, when David Hilbert was talking, I hope it would have challenged you with ideas such as automotive insurance will be commonplace in five decades. Why would everyone need a car? Or in the future, you may be paying for shopping and meals with Bakelite. How can plastic be used as money? We hope that some of the answers that we're looking at might reveal themselves, uh, but they may also be a boring slog of regulatory reform or a concession, perhaps, that there are no answers. Some answers might be revolutionary. For example, we talk about direct personal retirement cohorts. You are chosen to join an impartially selected group of 600 people distributed around the globe who, under the management of a central coordinator, are responsible directly for each other's retirement. The central coordinator directs your retirement cohort to save and sets out the long-term transfers of risk and reward. However, unlike a pension fund, perhaps a central co coordinator, he or she never controls your money, quite possibly held in some safe haven governed by international law. The cohort, in this case, might be your most important social network because it, not the state, is responsible for your financial security in retirement. We intend to investigate these types of innovations peer-to-peer -peer risk transfer, counter-cyclical pricing, government bond cuffs. Our first two publications are in your packs today and free online. An Eternal Brevity, where Malcolm Cooper looks at history using eternal coins, and a Finance Short, where David Stephen takes a long finance view of the contemporary mortgage market. Money is a medium of exchange exchanges values across time and space, and it cuts to the heart of what our society values. An equitable society requires fair exchange globally and with future generations. A sustainable society requires us to treasure scarce resources in an increasingly crowded planet. If you don't value it, you won't sustain it. So when you think about it, we have to be able to exchange in trust with the global community, present and future. And Anglo-Saxon models aren't the entire answer. The German ambassador, who's here in the audience today, once pointed out to me that despite two world wars and two economic collapses, his grandfather's pension was still paid. Our eternal coin thought experiment forces us to contrast our values with those of our great-great-grandchildren's. And this leads to my Zen cone. If you have some trust, I shall give you trust. If you have no trust, I shall take it away from you. So why today? Well, today's objectives are simple. One, the Long Now people are here to inspire us that projects like theirs can make a difference, and I welcome them. Two, you may be inspired by Long Finance to ask impertinent questions. And three, we want to engage you with a different event that adds hope and humor to some serious subjects. Time is too pressing for open discussion among 400 people, though many of you pre-submitted questions that will come up in the panels. I do hope Long Finance links you with others inspired to think about renewing our commerce with each other. Once you look through the lens of Long Finance, you realize that many of today's sustainability issues arise because society's core risk-reward transfer system finance isn't yet capable of handling long-term commerce. And I'm betting it's worth founding a long finance institute to develop these new approaches, or you can collect from me in 02078 when I'm 120. Thank you. Thank you. And now, you must open your hymn books 
towards the back to the page marked My Fund Man. For those of you without hymn books, please look inside your program, and I'd suggest you warm up your vocal cords as Brother Ian Harris shall lead us through our first interlude. Brother Harris. And the next one. Uh, there are two very good reasons why you should exercise your vocal cords on, uh, on this song. Um, in fact, there's, there's one very good reason. There's, there's one quite poor reason. We do have Brian Eno here, and all the, those of you who you know, still harbour those, um, you know, those thoughts of, you know, maybe I'll be spotted one day, well, you know, Brian, Brian's going to be listening with the rest of you. That's the bad reason. The good reason um, is, as you can see, I'm mic'd up, and I'm going to be singing. So, uh, un unless plenty of you join in with me, um, you will have to hear me singing this, and that's really not what you want. Now, I, I, I know a little bit about finance. I know a little bit more about words. I don't know very much about music, but I believe that this one is in the key of my. My. Is that right? My. The key of my. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to try to do a, um, a bouncing ball with this thing. Does that work? Yes. Um, so without further ado, Maestro. Here we go. My fund man said borrow and plan, so don't fret when you run up some debt. Off went me house to a mortgage tracker, in went the cash to an equity knacker, which dillied, then rallied, rallied, then dillied, lost its way and sank just like a stone. Oh, you can't trust the bankers, they're a load of thankless folk who repossessed my home. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Faisal Islam, I'm the, I'm the economics editor of Channel 4 News. Um, you don't hear from me, we've, we've got the whole long now executive team here. Uh, we're going to talk about its origins, uh, what they're doing now, and as befits the concept, the future of the Long Now Foundation. So I'd like to invite uh, Brian Eno, I don't think he needs much introduction, to begin with the origins of Long Now. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, by the end of the 1970s, I was just starting to get to the point that Aristotle had reached about two and a half thousand years before, which is understanding that the scale of things makes a difference to how they operate. Um, Aristotle's example was that if you scale a mouse up, its legs aren't strong enough. You have to, you have to scale the legs up much more than you scale the height. Um, I had also started to notice that the same thing was true of time, that duration actually made a difference not only of degree but of kind. And I had noticed that societies that thought in terms of weeks and months tended to think differently than societies that thought in terms of years and decades. Now, in 1978, I moved to New York, a very fast and at that time quite dangerous and pretty dysfunctional city and I noticed that everybody there was passing through actually there were very few people who felt that they were New Yorkers who lived in New York they were people who were on their way to somewhere else and so there was an attitude of being in the city for a short term uh, using the city as a springboard to move on to something else um, what that meant was that there was a a very dysfunctional civil society. <laughs> Things didn't work very well. The city was falling apart and in fact during that time I think went bankrupt at one point. Um, I, I came up with this idea that there was something called the short now and New York was, was living in the short now in the sense that if you said to somebody I would meet artists and I'd say what are you working on and they would tell me what they were working on that week not what their life project was or even their project for this year was but what they were doing that week or even that day and it seemed that their horizons their time horizons were very very short 
This made for a very exciting city because things were constantly changing. It was like living in a fashion store. Um, but it didn't make for a very functioning, smooth-running city. So having come up with the idea of that everybody there was living in the short now, I posed the opposite idea, which was the thought that the societies that I might prefer to live in were long now societies. And in fact, subsequently I met Stuart and various others, discovered that they were thinking along the pretty much the same lines. Peter Schwartz, one of our co-founders, was at that time working on a book called The Long View, <coughs> which was a book about business, trying to think of business in the long term. Stuart had been working for many years on projects that had very long-term ramifications. And so we came together for this project, which eventually took the name the Long Now Foundation. We've only got a short time here, so I'm now going to hand over to Alexander, who, who's the director of the Long Now Foundation, who will tell you something about what we do. The, uh, the projects of the Long Now Foundation really started with an idea by Danny Hillis, uh, who's a, a computer scientist who had this idea of a monument scale, all mechanical, 10,000 year clock, a, a physical artifact that if you went to visit it, in fact, the, the going to visit it, um, you would have different conversations about time and about your place in it than you would if this was not a physical artifact. And I think this is very much along the lines of what Neil Stevenson was talking about with making this eternal coin idea a physical thing, that, that physical objects have a very different um, ability to change conversation, where if we, just had, if we only had conferences, um, the ideas would be fleeting. But if we go ahead and build a physical object, that it could be much longer lasting. And that if you, if you take these design principles that Danny Hill started with, longevity, maintainability, transparency, evolvability, and scalability. These are all the things that we started measuring all clock designs against. But it is also uh, an interesting set of criteria to measure anything against, the eternal coin, any financial uh, instrument that you might be investing in. Back in 1999, I'm just going to do a, a quick tour, the, the geeky engineers version of, uh, of what we're working on uh, in very physical objects or initially. This was the first prototype of the clock. This is actually uh, housed here in London at the Science Museum. It's at the, at the end of the Making of the Modern World exhibit. Um, and I'll just talk very quickly. One of the engineering problems that we had to solve when designing a clock that had to last 10,000 years is that how do we keep the clock synchronized to a now point? And that we chose to use the sun. So every time the sun, anytime it's a sunny day at noon, it, we focus light through a lens, it heats up a piece of metal, that piece of metal expands, we get a mechanical trigger. So now you have a clock that keeps solar time. Now the problem with that is that what we keep uh, with pendulums is called absolute time, which doesn't vary based on where the Earth is in its orbit. And this is the analemma. It's also very similar to the Mobius strip, I notice. Um, this is the sun uh, at the same time of day taken throughout the year. Um, and so this constitutes a problem that we had of rectifying solar time to absolute time. The solution to that problem uh, Danny Hillis came up with, which is this physical shape. So this is that equation as it evolves for 10,000 years, that equation of plus or minus 15 minutes that rectifies that analemma to a straight line of noon um, is changing very slightly as the Earth wobbles on its axes every 26,000 years and the Earth slows its rotational rate by about a second a century. And of course, the other innovation that we had to do was the extra zero in front of the Gregorian year date for a five-year or a five-digit date. Since then, we've been working on larger prototypes. This is an orrery. It uh, shows the currently, or the human eye visible planets. And uh, this shows Mercury out through Saturn and is the part of the clock that would allow someone who doesn't understand our calendrics to look at the sky, look at our clock, and understand what exactly this thing might do, even if it was not working. We've also purchased the site for the monument scale version. We purchased this mountain in eastern Nevada. Um, it's called Mount Washington. It's uh, about as far as you can get from civilization in North America. Um, it's uh, 
five hour drive to any major airport. It's one of the darkest sky places in North America. Uh, pretty amazing sky viewing. It also has this amazing trait of not only very competent rock that we can put the clock into, the idea is to build the clock underground where it can last very long, but it also is populated by the oldest living organisms in the world, the bristlecone pine. Some of these trees have been dated to 4,800 years old. Um, and so uh, they themselves are, are a type of clock. We have uh, scientists who do core drilling of, of, of these and can tell us the climate and how many years that there was no sunshine, for instance, on that one site over the last 10,000 years by comparing dead and live tree rings. Um, right now, we're actually designing the machines to build the underground space. Um, we're combining the, tech, the diamond saw technology that's now being used in Carrara, Italy for quarrying marble with some of the, the mining technology that, um, that was being developed in Sudbury, Canada. This is a, a prototype. Oh, this is act the actual saw. It's a, a nine-foot reach diamond-toothed uh, robotic chainsaw. So we've roboticized a, uh, a saw to allow us to carve three-dimensional underground spaces that can uh, be strong enough to, to uh, handle the seismic issues of eastern Nevada. Uh, this saw has a nine-foot blade and a 32-foot reach and allow us to carve spiral underground staircases. <coughs> the, um, so a as you can see, when, when you do start to solve problems very physically, you have to think about these things very differently. What are the hands of the people going to be like that might wind this clock? Are they going to have, you know, if you're building a spiral staircase, are you going to build a spiral staircase that has the same foot pitch that we now consider to be a normal foot pitch? If you've ever been on the Mayan pyramids, uh, you'll, you quickly realize that they had a very different idea of what a step was than we do. Um, the last couple projects that I'm talk I'll talk about are, are information-based projects. Um, also, it, back in 1999, we started a, a project called the Rosetta Project. And we had thought, uh, probably naively, that we could just collect all the world's languages uh, in one place. They were probably already digitized, probably already online, and then we would uh, micro-etch them into a medium that could last for 10,000 years, and it turned out, of course, that nobody had ever put all that information together anywhere. So it began a 10-year effort, that, uh, or a nine-year effort. We just finished it this year. Um, but we have over 1,500 languages uh, micro-etched on this disk. This is the, uh, that's 13,000 pages micro-etched. Um, and we collected things like uh, the first three chapters of the Bible, which is one of the most trans translated things in the world, as well as maps and uh, basic information about all the, all the languages that we could find. And that's what those pages start to look like close up. And the last project that I'll talk about is Long Bets. This, was, uh, this was, came out of uh, one of Stuart Brand's ideas for a responsibility roster. And the idea is that if people, you know, often at conferences like this will make a prediction about what the future will be like, and they're very rarely held accountable for it. And one of the best ways to make those, those bets very real, of course, is to attach money to them. Uh, just this year, Warren Buffett bet protege partners over a 10-year period, uh, commencing in January 1st, 2008, and ending uh, in 2017, that the S&P 500 will outperform a portfolio of hedge funds. Um, so far, we've just got the first update on the first year of that, and right now the, uh, the hedge funds are actually winning, amazingly, um, over, the the last, uh, over the last year. Um, but they bet a million dollars. We have probably about 80 or 90 bets and about 150 different predictions that are waiting for other, the other side to, uh, to take those bets. Um, and we plan on keeping these around long enough that not only can we say who won and who lost, but we can also take a look at these detailed arguments and see if the way people were thinking about the future, the arguments that they made, it, in fact, is there something extractable out of that that we can learn from th that will teach us how to think about our futures better? And I'll leave you with this one economic example of 10,000 year thinking. Uh, I was trying to think actually on the plane over here, is there a real 10,000 year uh, economic uh, example, and, and I was reminded of the Meslant barrier. 
And this is the, the barrier in, uh, in Holland. Uh, it was designed for a once in a 10,000 year event. No one's actually seen the storm that this thing is possibly designed for. The cost of building this is over 600 million euros. That's very, very expensive infrastructure, right? Hurricane Katrina was a once in a century event. Killed over 1,800 people and is currently costing the United States $110 billion. So you basically get 100 times leverage for thinking on these time scales that the, that the Dutch are thinking uh, by simply thinking uh, a little bit ahead. You, d you do have to fund that infrastructure, uh, which is very difficult to do when things are all going just fine. But the day that that storm arrives, everyone wish you did. Thank you. When we were just getting this going in the 1990s, Danny Hillis and I, uh, we connected with Brian. We hired Alexander, who was then very young. And uh, not, not quite as bald. I, I had know. hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So did we all. Um, I had a, a, a son named Noah who reads even more science fiction than I do. He was in his teens at that time. And uh, he said, uh, do you know about Robert Heinlein? Oh, come on, I grew up on Robert Heinlein. Do you know about a book by Robert Heinlein called Time for the Stars? I'm not sure I remember that one. Well, I can see why. It was written in 1956, and it's his only kind of grim novel. It's a downer. But the reason um, Noah told me about the book, I'll just read a few passages, is the idea is these are the first interstellar astronauts who are shaping up to go to the stars, time for the stars. And, um, but the, the reason it is happening is there's this thing called, we got interested in the purposes of the Long Range Foundation. Its coat of arms reads, bread cast upon the waters. And his charter is headed, dedicated to the welfare of our descendants. The charter goes on with a lot of lawyers' fog, but the way the directors have interpreted it is it has to spend money only on things that no government and no other corporation would touch. It wasn't enough for a proposed project to be interesting to science and socially desirable. It also had to be so horribly expensive that no one else would touch it, and the prospective results had to lie so far in the future that it could not be justified to taxpayers or shareholders. To make the LRF directors light up with enthusiasm, you had to suggest something that cost a billion or more. <coughs> that was back in the day when it meant something. <laughs> and probably wouldn't show results for 10 generations, if ever. Something like how to control the weather. They're working on that. The funny thing is that the bread cast upon the waters does come back 700-fold. The most preposterous projects made the LRF embarrassing amounts of money. Embarrassing to a nonprofit corporation, that is. Take space travel. It seemed tailor-made back a couple of hundred years ago for LRF since it was fantastically expensive and offered no probable results uh, comparable with the investments. So the Long Range Foundation stepped in after the military and everybody else gave up and they happily began wasting money. It came at a time when the corporation unfortunately had made a few billion on the Thompson mass converter, which when they had expected to spend at least a century on pure research, since they could not declare a dividend, no stockholders, they had to get rid of the money somehow, and space travel looked like a swell rat hole to pour it down. <laughs> Even the kids know what happened to that. Ortega's torch made space travel easy inside the solar system and fast and cheap. And the one-way energy screen made colonization practicable and profitable. The Long Range Foundation could not unload fast enough to keep from making lots more money. So this, the Long Range Foundation um, Brian came up with the idea of the long now, uh, all seem to kind of blend in and frankly the idea of a long bank has been percolating in the background for a while so we're you know, interested in what's come, come arrived at here. Um, I'm mainly in England now flogging a book called Whole Earth Discipline and the, um, the connection here is I'm puzzled by the economics, the theory of infrastructure. Civilizations, cities, all these important things really, really depend on sewer systems that work. What you were saying about New York is the case. What uh, the lowlands that are below basically sea level, especially increasingly, uh, require serious infrastructure to keep going. But I have not been able to find a really good economic theory of infrastructure. Basically, it's been cut and try for centuries. And people come up with these, the, the reality is we come up with these grand schemes, uh, financial excuses are made, 
uh, bonds are passed and everything goes forward. The finances don't work out anything like what people planned. Uh, if they're initial investors, they lose money and then somebody else buys into it and, and uh, the sunk costs are ignored and they move ahead. And we see it with wind farms, we see it with nuclear. Basically, it's the third owner who gets to make money. But we build these things anyway. So that's pretty interesting. I would love to see a real theory, economic theory, of infrastructure go forward. Not only for the build infrastructure, because you look at the bridges over the Thames, <clears throat> they make London, in a sense, possible as a, as a river straddling city. But the Thames itself is infrastructure. So the bridge is infrastructure, the river is infrastructure. There's a lot of natural infrastructure that can be thought of and can be funded and can be maintained the same way we think about built infrastructure. And we're just now realizing that these so-called ecosystem services, you blow them up to the large scale in the long term, climate is one of them. A stable climate is all that civilization has known for the last 10,000 years. Basically, we had the stability to make agriculture grow forward, make cities go forward, and civilization was able to invent itself in this good, large-scale, long-term weather that we've had. We're now really realizing the byproduct of all that success of ours is that we may be um, <laughs> messing with the healthiness of the ecosystem of the weather, a very complex system that we uh, require in order to function. And so we're having to step up to an infrastructural relationship to the atmosphere, the climate, of the whole damn planet. This is a larger scale issue than the Thames, or London, or England, or the global north. You know, five out of six people live in developing countries. They are busily getting out of poverty and building cities faster than anybody ever has and all the rest of it. So the scale of the issues we're now dealing with, I think, require um, comfort with thinking long term, which is all long now is about, is making people ideally comfortable thinking in multi-hundred, multi-thousand year terms. And please, we would like uh, some long finance to do all this with. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Okay, well, um, lots to talk about. I mean, I'm a TV reporter. I'm pretty used to the working on a very short-term basis. Mm. Some of the financiers here have been accused <coughs> of working on a rather short-term basis. What is the essence of the 10,000 year horizon? Is it totemic? I mean, are you just happy to get people's hori time horizons out to, you know, just 50 or 100 years? Why 10,000 years? The number came from Peter Schwartz, one of our founding directors, and um, was here for a long time at Royal Dutch Shell, head of scenario planning there, and did this book called The Art of the Long View. And Peter said, um, civilization sort of started with towns and agriculture. That happened basically uh, 10,000 years ago. The ice retreated in the northern hemisphere at that time. It's a, a good, good kind of start point. And if you assume, and you come to a, a, a scientific idea, which is that it's always helpful to assume that whatever you're looking at, you're sort of in the normative, you're in the middle of it. And so if civilization has lasted 10,000 years so far, you assume we're in the middle of that story, then the next 10,000 years fills out the symmetry. Brian came up with the term the long now, so for us the long now is the, the current 20,000 years. And the idea is to, just as we think of last week and next week as sort of the operative now that we work in, you know, can you think about the last 10,000 years the way you think about last week? And can you think about the next 10,000 years the way you think about next week? And if we can accomplish that, then, uh, then we start waving our hands fast. We assume good things will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, when you um, put these sorts of ideas out there, do you get the response? I mean, are you expecting the response from the sort of average person in the street to sort of care about the utility of somebody in 50, 100, 500,000, 10,000 years' time as much as they care about somebody right now? Well... <clears throat> Back to a point that Alexander made, that the physicality of something makes a very big difference to it. If it's just a thought experiment, it's, it's forgotten as a thought experiment could be. But the fact that we've actually started making these clocks, we're currently building one in Texas. We've got a prototype in the Science Museum here. Um, the fact that they have actually started to take physical reality has really made people interested in them in a different way. So people start to think about the design problems. They say, well, how can you possibly know that there won't be another Dark Ages? Mm -hmm. 
in the next thousand years, for example. And we say, well, of course we can't. But just the fact of people engaging their mind in that way, to think a thousand years in the future is already, even at a, the sketchiest level, is far beyond what any of us ever normally think. So, so the fact of this thing coming into existence and being more than just a metaphor makes a big difference, I think. People do start to think about it. But we have a, we have a culture, do we not, that's incredibly fast, incredibly disposable. It's the, in many ways the very opposite of some of the stuff that we've just been talking about. Well, really, the seed of this, as um, the seed of the clock, really came from Danny Hillis, who, was, who had at the time just built the world's fastest computer. Um, and he was very aware of how, finally, we're slicing time up now. You know, we're, we're talking in much, much faster periods of time than nanoseconds. Um, and he, he was aware that our horizons were, we, we were intensely interested in the, in the very near future and correspondingly disinterested in the far future. I mean, we have a, we have a sort of long now parable that we tell, which I, th I think is a true story. Um, new College in Oxford, uh, being English of course, it's not that new, it was built I think in 1480. <laughs> and in the 1960s, the great big beams across the top of New College, big oak beams, they're enormous, they're that big, um, started to decay. And so the uh, College Bursar went to the head woodsman, because Oxford owns a lot of land all over England, went to the head woodsman and said, um, do you think anywhere that we have wood to replace these beams? And the woodsman said, well, yes, sir. <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that when the college was built, they had planted another grove of oaks to replace the beams. <laughs> so those oaks had been quietly growing for 500 years. Um, and in fact, they, they are now the new beams in New College Oxford. So, it's, it's they interesting. They planted another set of, of They trees. planted some new ones, okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's interesting that we as humans now are at the, at the very peak of our power. We've never been more powerful. You know, any one of us is as powerful as half an army was a thousand years ago. We've never been more powerful, but we've never been less responsible <coughs> about, about future events. We, we tend not to think in those very long terms like, 500 years, or even 25 years, actually. So it's quite ironic if it, I mean, okay, let me throw this out to Xander. When I travel around doing economic reports all around the world, am I, I, maybe you're going to think I'm making a conceptual mistake here, but the people planning more for the next decades appear to be the people that are less democratic. Is there a structural issue there? Mm. Well, I, I think that you do see worldwide, there is an interesting, um, there's an interesting thing that happens if, you, uh, if you're going to rule a country for your whole life as a monarch, for instance, you, are, you do think longer term than a democratically mm. elected system. Um, and you know, England with its dual systems, I think, has get some of that. It was just, I think Brian just, just sent me a, a set of photographs of uh, the, the current queen with all the presidents since, was it Eisenhower? Yes. And of the United States, and you, you realize that you know, where else do you see that kind of consistency except in a, in a monarchy? And, and, you know, that's kind of fallen from rule to more ceremonial role, but the, the, even that ceremonial role has a consistency that you don't see in normal democratic systems, which are, are by definition uh, a churning system, and they, they, they fit well with the, um, the capitalist systems that have also driven our, our financial problems with that kind of churn as well. Um, in the growth phase, but they don't fit well when you have something that looms over 80 or 90 years, like the uh, like the the property values dropping only once in 90 years. How does that? How, how can a politician who's elected for four years plan for around um, the property values, which everything is leveraged on, falling? In, at some indeterminate point in their future. They, they just can't. So it, it's, I think in Germany there, there was a move to alter the constitution to account for the uh, future rights of future generations. I don't, I don't know where that went. I, I, I didn't quite keep a track of that. Perhaps the ambassador can tell us later. But um, um, do you think that the normal churning of democracy every four, five, ten years, there'd be some way to kind of take account of 
longer term generational equity, not just over 20, 40 years, but over hundreds of years? Well, I mean, so far the answer is no. Um, we, we, I, don't, I can't think of any good examples. Stuart? Do you, I mean, do you well, likewise with finance. Um, you know, the problem of discounting the future. That you raised the question earlier of how do you fund a forest? And uh, you know, putting money in a forest where you get return basically in 70 years' time versus putting the same amount of money in the bank where you get the same amount of return in a lot shorter than 70 years, you know, what just happened? doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, every now and then somebody liquidates a forest. A company came named Maxim, next name, came into Northern California, bought up a nice old family firm that was logging redwoods sustainably in Northern California and cut all the damn things down because it made economic sense to do that. And you know, I know environmentalists and economists and so on have been trying to figure out how do you blend in the externalities and all the rest of this. Um, I don't think we've solved the problem of discounting the future yet in finance, just as I don't think we've solved the problem of long-term responsibility in democracies yet. So one place you might look for some sorts of solutions to this are the are the most long-term businesses we know that are religions, basically. Mm. Um, the interesting thing about religions <laughs> is that they, they offer other rewards than financial ones. <laughs> <laughs> now, I happen not to believe in them myself, but I'm starting <laughs> to think I should encourage other people to. <laughs> <laughs> you, most you of the people that talk. <laughs> yeah, I believe in gospel really singing, yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> Do you think that this mindset uh, is consistent with being free marketeer? Can this be achieved through the market? Well, how free is free? Because none of us are really free marketeers. You'll notice that even in countries that, such as America that claim to be free market, there are, for instance, restrictions on monopolies. There, there are always restrictions. Nobody actually really wants a free market because it's utterly chaotic and you're just as likely to get slaughtered whatever position you are in the free market. So, so I question that phrase. What, what you're really talking about is on, on the long spectrum between total control and total freedom, where do you want to situate yourself? And that's, that's all that happens in capitalist countries. They, they argue about which position along the line they are. It's not about free or unfree. It's about where on the spectrum you are. Okay, and Stuart, you know, following... Sorry, go, go on. We keep coming back to physicality and um, the eternal coin paper that is in everybody's lap. I thought the, the most telling thing in it, um, when you're looking at sort of what, were, what sustained value at various times in human history, and one that jumped out at me was land, which sort of maps onto something I've noticed, which is even longer lived than religions is some cities. Um, you know, Jericho has been a town for 10,000 years. Um, Jerusalem has changed religion 36 times and been captured and burned and all this kind of stuff and it's still, it was an important city 5,000 years ago and it is now. So cities have this capability, this enormous longevity and enormous adaptability, but a peculiarity of cities is that they are actually quite physical. There's a place, there's you know, the land, there's the real estate value. And so three things I now want is I want theory of infrastructure, please, economic theory. I want an economic theory of uh, the informal economy, which is sustaining most of the developing world and where people are getting the hell out of complete poverty into uh, toward participating in the global economy. And I would like a theory of real estate that would reflect basically the entire history of real estate. There's probably 2,000 histories of architecture, all of which are frivolous. <laughs> and there's not a single history of real estate. Mm -hmm. which would tell us why these cities have this longevity in some cases, why some are really longer lived than others and the rest of it. And for all I knew, the fundamental coin of living on a planet may well be expressible in land terms, in real estate terms, and that's what we should conjure around. Mm -hmm. Let me bring in something very kind of recent where the world was invited to think about the long-term consequences of their actions and share out the burden, and it didn't seem to work out. We are talking about Copenhagen. It doesn't seem, when the world has been invited, that they play ball with the idea of looking after future generations and sharing that burden equitably across <coughs> nations. Are you, would you be depressed by that type of thing? Well, I think it, it fits into the category that, that Brian said, is that 
you know, it, it just depends on what system you invite everyone in to play in. And in, in Copenhagen, they, they invite 192 countries, each one with veto power. Like, there's no system in the world that could function that way. And so it's set up for failure. Um, if you set the rules for failure, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, you know, currently our, our capitalist systems are set for a very short-term return. Um, you know, just as, as Stuart's been pointing out in his, in his recent book, that until you make coal expensive, more expensive than carbon-free alternatives, you, every country is going to burn their coal till it's gone. Um, and so there's, there's, there's no way around that. So you, you do have to set rules, and you just have to pick and choose what those rules are. And so um, I think it, it comes down to game theory and, mm. and how you're going to do it. Yeah. I mean, they, don't even, they can't even agree on sharing the benefits of trade. It doesn't seem particularly likely that you'd agree on sharing the uh, economic, short-term economic disbenefits of, of taking, making sacrifices for future generations. Um, does this require basically stronger international coordination, stronger international government governance <coughs> structures, basically. My expectation is <coughs> if climate keeps scaring us and it shows signs of doing that, and we don't get ahead of mitigation of cutting back on greenhouse gases in time, that we will take geoengineering seriously, direct intervention in the climate. And climatologists have seen some ex successful examples of that, of, of uh, you know, a volcano goes up in the Philippines in 1991 and the next year uh, you've got a lot more polar bear cubs because the whole planet cooled down by half a degree Celsius. Okay, so that works. Um, and so there are now half a dozen going on to a dozen good projects of how you might cool the earth directly just by going at climate. That's the easy problem. The hard problem is the political one. Because you know, one of the schemes is, is you could actually keep the planet cool while we double our carbon dioxide for an expense of maybe 300 million a year. That's nothing. Uh, there are wealthy people, probably some in this room, who could just do that. Um, China could certainly just do that. And China may well have few reason to. They're having serious droughts in the Northwest. They're getting sea level problems and extreme weather problems on the South Coast. And they can just say, well, screw it. Let's just put a bunch of sulfur dust in the stratosphere and fix that little problem. Well, all the rest of us who live downwind of China, which is everybody, would say, actually, that's an act of war. So, because we don't, the UN is not going to step up to that. The market is not going to step up to that. The current international relations that we have are not yet in place to work out the norms and the agreements and the transparencies and all the rest of it to where you can start doing geoengineering in a serious way. So, my expectation is, and I think Brian loves this and should probably carry it forward a bit, is that more increments of global governance will emerge from the climate issues that we'll be dealing with over the next basically over this century. Okay. Is that your view, Brian? Yeah. Well, people are terrified, some of them, by the idea of global governance, um, especially English people, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're in charge. <laughs> Not yes, they're, they're in charge. <laughs> yeah. We have a whole political party organized to prevent that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, but as I always point out to them, we have been living with many, many examples of it for a long time. For instance, none of us as far as I know, are uh, complaining about the International Postal Union, <laughs> which was formed in 1879 and which is one of the most successful forms of global cooperation ever. Um, every country in the world belongs to it, and it's, it's a very sophisticated mechanism that ensures that if you post a letter in Birmingham, it gets delivered in Kabul or wherever, you know. And all you know about it is that you bought a stamp. It's an amazing system, mm. and we've all been doing it for years. It's a form of all these complicated reciprocal agreements between 165 countries, I think, belong to it. Um, it's, it's a form of governance, you know. We're quite happy with it. We don't complain about it. Um, and there, there are many other examples. That some of them are really very obscure, like there is uh, an international agreement uh, for the genetic labeling of mice. <laughs> um, which, which has 59 countries subscribed to it. Do you know this? <laughs> <laughs> Have you never labelled a mouse? <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got about a minute. And oh, sorry. Uh, this yes, is, this is, this is maybe long for Nance, but we, uh, we're going to be very tight on time. I'm gonna, I want 30 seconds from each of you. <coughs> Had the eternal clock existed before Europe industrialised, how would the world be different now? 
Wow. Zander. <coughs> well, it's, it's always been our uh, fantasy that if we, if we choose exactly the right mountain in exactly uh, the right place, that if we dig into it, we'll actually find the clock already there. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> so what would, how would our world be different if we, if we were to all of a sudden find it or if we were to, to always have had it? it? And so, I mean, curiously, the person who connected uh, R2 Foundation's Neil Stevenson played this out in a science fiction book uh, of another world that was ruled by uh, both a, a very fast civilization of mini malls and cell phones and a very slow civilization of academics um, and uh, thinkers that were thinking through the world's long-term problems. <coughs> and uh, it's, it's nearly a thousand pages long, so I, I, we probably shouldn't get into it there, but I'll, I'll just plug that as, your, as, as a way to possibly look at that. It's cool. Anathem. 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 Yeah. It's just, the book is Anathem. It's first rate. The goal of the Long Now Foundation is uh, we'll know we've succeeded when long-term thinking is automatic and common instead of difficult and rare. Thanks, Stuart. Brian, last word. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in answer, I'm trying to answer your question. We, in a sense, we do have some examples, as I said about religions, we do have some examples of, of icons that have lasted for a very long time. My problem with religions is that I think they haven't generally inspired people to exactly the kind of behavior that I would like to see. But um, I, I do think we can take some strength from the fact that Certain images and metaphors exist for very, very long periods. All sorts of civilizational change can happen, and they can stay in place. And so I think we're hoping that this would be one of those. Great. Well, thanks <coughs> you so much for coming here. And uh, a round of applause for this.